So I always try to uh, hire people who are uh, open, communicative, who want to, uh, who are motivated, who are excited about these problems. Depends a little bit on what you want to do as a student, but I think in general, it's not, um, the most interesting is not to just join somewhere to publish papers and that's it. I mean, you should develop some critical thinking, you should develop some, some scientific uh, rigor, and you should uh, develop the experience of sharing time and experiences with other PhD students. So it's not about just trying to uh, have more funding and more projects and more people uh, because at the end, the amount of time that you will be able to spend on each of those things will be smaller no? when you have many, many things going on. Because there is a very important um, connection to establish between the, the student and the supervisor. Uh, it's not only about technical things. Uh, there needs to be a personal connection that you can actually communicate. You can work well together. You can trust each other. And I think that's, uh, that's important to develop over some time. You know, one person cannot be a big expert on everything. That's, that's a principle of life. You can't know it all and you need to know that. What you need to know is that um, you can uh, communicate effectively, you can collaborate, you can rely on other people. Hello students, you all are aware about computational fluid dynamics, right? Which is also called as CFD in a short form. So for those who are not aware about CFD, it is a specialized field within fluid mechanics. You know fluid, right? Like liquids and gases. So CFD is a specialized field within fluid dynamics that uses the computational power of computers to model and analyze how fluids like liquids and gases behave in various situations. You can think in this way that CFD is kind of a digital laboratory where scientists and engineers can simulate and study things like how air flows around the wings of an aircraft how water moves through the pipes or even how blood circulates within our bodies through the arteries. By creating these uh, virtual simulations, CFD allows scientists and experts to understand and optimize the performance of uh, various systems within the need to build physical prototypes. And why we are interested in this because this has several real-world examples. For example, building and testing physical prototypes be quite expensive and time-consuming, right? But one good news is that uh, CFD enables engineers to explore numerous design possibilities swiftly and at a very lower cost. In other words, this helps engineers and designers or you can say scientists to design better cars, planes, and other things without having to build the real models. Don't you think it saves time and money? And it also helps them to come up with various new ideas. Now, as we all know that this is a time of AI is booming now, the integration of artificial intelligence and CFD is particularly powerful for optimizing the design of various objects such as aerodynamic cars and aircraft, as I mentioned earlier. As we all know that AI algorithms can analyze large data set to find the best shapes and configurations for improving performances, right? Apart from that, there are also several other applications actually. For example, in the medical field, the combination of AI and CFD can simulate and analyze blood flow in arteries and veins. And this can assist in diagnosis and treatment planning for vascular conditions. In addition, there are some more interesting applications. The combinations of CFD and AI can be applied to manage water resources more effectively by predicting river flow, groundwater levels, and optimizing water distribution systems. So long story short, what I'm trying to convey is while combined with AI, CFD becomes more powerful, enabling faster, more accurate simulations and driving innovation across uh, diverse industries from aerospace and automotive engineering to healthcare and environmental sciences. Okay, so why I am saying this is we have a very special guest today, Professor Ricardo Vainuesa, whose work primarily focuses on AI and CFD simulations. If you are interested in mechanical engineering or pursuing your studies, 
already in mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering and want to build a career in this direction, I can promise you about one thing that this podcast will be very helpful for you, okay? Because Professor Vainuesa has shared many insightful discussions here. And on top of that, he has also provided specific information about what makes an ideal candidate if you are thinking to join his group. We have had a very nice conversation, I would say. And I hope that you will all enjoy. And top of that, you will learn lots of things from today's discussion. Okay, so without any further delay, let us begin our today's session. So, uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us. I would like to express my gratitude for joining us today. So, uh, we are definitely going to have lots of interesting discussions today. So, uh, begin with, as many of us already know that uh, you have completed your Bachelor of Science, which we call BTEC in India. You have completed your BS in Mechanical Engineering in Spain. And from there, you went to Illinois Institute of Technology to pursue your higher studies. You have completed your master's and then from PhD. So could you please briefly share your journey from your undergraduate studies uh, to where you are today? Yeah, well, first, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, very nice to be chatting with you today. And uh, yeah, I'm originally from Valencia in Spain. It's actually nice because just uh, last week um, they celebrated the European Turbulence Conference there. So it was great to be back and to, and to really uh, reconnect with my roots a bit. That was quite fun. Uh, so yeah, I studied there my, my bachelor in mechanical engineering. Then there I got a scholarship to do my master's studies in Chicago in the US in the Illinois Institute of Technology. And then there I, at that time I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do research or not, but I like the environment. I like the people. I really love Chicago. It's an incredible city. So then I stayed for a PhD. I had the opportunity to stay there and I really, really liked it. Uh, after that, I spent a year in industry in Spain. So I went back and worked with co consulting companies uh, connected with Airbus. Uh, but I missed uh, research. I really wanted to go back to doing research. So at some point, I got the opportunity of going for a postdoc to KTH in Stockholm. That's where I am right now. Uh, this is nine years ago. So I quit my job. I abandoned the, the house that I had there and everything. I had a complete life in Madrid with a permanent position. I came for a one-year contract in Stockholm. And then I, I like it here and I stayed. So this is now nine years ago. I have my, my group, my research area, and my activities here. I really enjoy it. Uh, and I really love Stockholm. So it's really, really a fantastic place. Okay. Thanks for sharing this. So uh, as you have mentioned that you have already have some industry experience. So is it necessary to have some industry experience before joining in some academic institution? I mean, having an industry exposure is uh, quite helpful, do you think? So I don't think it's necessary um, and depends, of course, on what type of research you do. If your research is more applied, then having an industrial connection is going to be helping you. If your research is more fundamental, then probably doesn't really matter. Uh, in my case, even if my research is uh, reasonably fundamental, I work with, um, with turbulent flows uh, and then I apply many methods of machine learning, AI and, and more novel computing techniques. Uh, but my connection with industry was actually helpful because it really helped me to uh, look at things from another perspective to see how um, people in the industrial settings think and how can that really help in terms of collaborations and funding. Uh, yeah, so I would say that for sure it was a helpful uh, experience for me. Okay, thank you for sharing these insights. So uh, I have my second question is this, that uh, most of the time uh, students usually know their supervisor before joining uh, to their group or at least they're familiar with the type of the work they're doing. So in your case, where are you also familiar with your um, supervisor before joining his team? No, I was not familiar uh, with his work. I mean, when I came um, to Chicago, I started the master program there and then you, you are taking courses, you interact with different uh, professors, working on different topics. Uh, and then I, I really I met my supervisor in the fluid mechanics co course. I really liked it, and we liked uh, discussing and working together. 
Um, I started with my master thesis with him, and then we we liked the work, and then we continued for the for the PhD. So I basically got to know him and his work there uh, when I was at the university, um, and of course, since we met. Uh, being in the courses together, then that really helped me to, to get an idea no, of what it would look like to work with him. Uh, I know that in other places, um, the, the recruitment for PhD students is different because uh, sometimes you, you don't really hire all the students from the courses that you teach at the university, but it's people that come from outside. And that's not always very uh, easy because you as a student don't know the professor or maybe you know their work, but you don't know them personally. You as a, as a faculty who's trying to recruit someone, you don't really know the student either because you rely on, on the interview and the CV and, and these things. But the ideal situation is when you know each other for a while uh, through courses, no? and you can really interact a bit through the courses. And that's really the best, uh, the best thing to do. Uh, it's not always possible, but I think it's... Uh, then you really, really know if you connect, no? because there is a very important um, connection to establish between the, the student and the supervisor. Uh, it's not only about technical things. Uh, there needs to be a personal connection that you can actually communicate. You can work well together. You can trust each other. And I think that's, uh, that's important to develop over some time. So uh, do you suggest that uh, before joining as a full-time PhD, a student should have uh, some some sort of environment experience? Uh, maybe meanwhile, she can join as an internship or in the master's last six months. Do you think that this I mean, joining for a short time would be helpful before joining as a full-time? I mean, of course, that's not always possible uh, for the student or even for the institution. Um, so it's not, I understand that it's not the, the easiest, but I, I think that uh, that helps. That helps because then you can really get an idea of the environment where you are. And maybe you can even talk to different faculty and choose the, the supervisor that you would like the most. So in principle, uh, that's a good strategy, but it's not the only successful strategy. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, there are places where you just need to apply and go through the process and there's no possibility to be there before. No? So then uh, depends a bit on the other place. Yes, true. So how was your work experience and collaborations with, with your supervisor, Professor Nagib? Yeah, it was really great. I mean, I think um, my particular experience, I am someone very independent who really like to, since I was a student, to, to develop my ideas and to work on different topics. Uh, to, I was, uh, since very early, uh, leading teams and supervising other students and kind of getting ideas together. Uh, and I had the possibility to develop all these ideas. No? So at the end, uh, at least for me, that style and that environment was, was excellent. No? That really allowed me to thrive and to, and to learn and to develop all this supervision and, and, and leadership skills that have been helpful later in my career. So all these leadership skills, independent thinking, you have gained this. I mean, your, your supervisor helped you to gain this while doing your PhD. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about the interaction with the supervisor uh, and also the environment that is created, the atmosphere in the group. Um, and not all the groups are the same, right? I mean, I think... Uh, Depends a little bit on what you want to do as a student, but I think in general, it's not... Um, the most interesting is not to just join somewhere to publish papers and that's it. I mean, you should, you know, you should develop some critical thinking. You should develop some some scientific uh, rigor, and you should uh, develop the experience of sharing time and experiences with other PhD students. No, so at the end, uh, those are the those are the aspects that will, first of all, uh, make your PhD experience much richer and much more interesting. Uh, and second, if later in the future you want to. You know, develop your own ideas and follow your own career path, uh, then those, you know, critical thinking and independent thinking skills are very important. So after uh, completing your PhD, you have received numerous awards and accolades and uh, several research grants are you have already backed in such a short span of time. So I have this question that uh, which one do you think motivates you the most and uh, had made a uh, significant impact on your research career? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky question because at the end of the day, we don't do research to, to win awards or, you know, get things like that. I mean, it's of course nice and it's uh, always good to get recognized, but that's not the purpose. Uh, I mean, all of them uh, are 
are special and they are uh, nice. Um, I think uh, it's, for example, it was quite special with the um, IIT Alumnus uh, Award um, because as a recognition of my university when I did my master and my PhD, that they recognize you 10 years after you finish your PhD, your career, that you're someone who did something that the university is proud of. So in that sense, that made me feel good. Uh, but of course, the, the probably the, the well, the recognition that has had the biggest impact in my career has been the, the current ERC consolidator grant that I have. This is uh, from the European Research Council, which is really, really allowed me to develop a lot of the activities that we have uh, with the machine learning, fluid mechanics, uh, flow control um, in turbulent wings, which is actually something that we are very excited about. So thank you. I wish you all the best for this. So uh, could you, uh, you could you provide a concise overview of your research, particularly focusing on your work uh, related to fluid mechanics and turbulent flows and and also AI? You are yes. also doing lots of good work on AI. If you can also focus on that as well. Thank you. So I work, um, first of all, on high performance computing. So we try to do very uh, complex and very uh, very detailed simulations of turbulent flows. Uh, I mean, this, uh, when we increase the Reynolds number, the flow becomes chaotic and, and hard to predict. And its physics is actually some very, very challenging. Uh, so we've been conducting very resolved simulations in complex geometries like wings, wings with twin tips, uh, urban environments. So really, really challenging uh, flow simulations. Uh, and at the same time with machine learning, we've been developing many different applications uh, involving flow estimation, uh, reduce order modeling, uh, flow control. Uh, so perhaps one of the areas where we are most, most excited about now is uh, using deep reinforcement learning to develop new strategies to control the flow. And with these deep reinforcement learning strategies, we can actually uh, find novel ways to uh, tackle the, uh, well, the turbulent fluctuations in the flow and really significantly reducing the drag of these uh, turbulent flows. So I think that's an area that is giving us a lot of potential. We're only scratching the surface and we're very, very uh, interested in what's coming in the next uh, months and years. When I was in Airbus, uh, in fact, when I was at Airbus, I was working more on the structural side. Uh, so I was not doing so much fluid mechanics, but more uh, optimization. We were doing, working on the uh, optimization of the rib inside the, the wing. Uh, but of course, at the end, this is a high dimensional complex problem in engineering. Uh, connected with aeronautics. Uh, so in a way, when I was in industry, I was looking at the inside of the wing and now we're looking at the flow around the wing. Uh, but uh, in the end, the industrial experience uh, gives you some context no, on how things are actually working in an industrial setting and how things are deployed. No? So uh, even if at the end I miss the research work and the pace of uh, industrial uh, work it's not fully aligned with what I want to do. Uh, it really gave me an interesting perspective. No? Basically, uh, one can well, one can really, really look at a problem in a lot of detail uh, with a lot of simplification and really trying to see very canonical conditions. But at the end, what you want is uh, something that, that works. No? And then we can combine uh, tools of very high-level academic work, uh, like uh, DNS, direct numerical simulation, novel machine learning methods, high-performance computing, with flows that are progressively more and more practical and more applied, so wings and three-dimensional wings, uh, windy vortices. Uh, so in that sense, pushing these tools to uh, cases that are progressively more and more applied and more practical, uh, I think is one of the directions where we can learn and we can apply science uh, towards, first of all, uh, useful problems, but second, more challenging problems, no? because you are really mixing a lot of interesting physical uh, phenomena together. So how AI can be incorporated in this direction? Well, uh, I can tell you about my ERC project. Uh, the idea is to um, control, so via active flow control, the flow around turbulent wings to reduce the drag you know, and to increase the aer aerodynamic efficiency of these, of these elements. So if you have the wing surface, let's imagine that this is the wing surface and the flow is going in this direction. Uh, the first thing that we do uh, is that we want to uh, design a control, so a set of jets that are blowing or sucking flow in such a way that the uh, flow uh, exhibits a reduced drag, you know, so we can have a better aerodynamic performance. So the first thing that we do is that we can measure at the wall, and based on the measurements at the wall, we can use computer vision, we can use convolutional neural networks, 
GANs, we can use vision transformers, we can use units, many different possible uh, computer vision tools to predict what happens above the wall. And with the information of the flow above the wall, and now that we know what the flow is actually doing, uh, we can use deep reinforcement learning to, uh, based on the state of the flow, based on the prediction of what the flow is doing, design the optimal distribution of blowing and suction on the wind. So we can actually attenuate the turbulent fluctuations, go towards relaminarization. We're not relaminarizing the flow, but we're really attenuating those fluctuations in such a way that we can uh, maximize the aerodynamic performance of that. Thank you for such an insightful uh, of your research work. I think it will be helpful for the viewers as well. So uh, before moving on to the next questions, I would like to inform our viewers that uh, Professor Vinuesa leads a quite sizable research group. He has uh, students ranging from master's level to postdocs. And he also collaborates with various external uh, partners as well. So with that said, I just, uh, I mean, my question is related to this, that how do you manage all these responsibilities? Yeah, first of all, I really love uh, research. And I think uh, when you're liking and uh, thriving with what you're doing, then you're more motivated not to do things well. Uh, and also, I really think it's essential to create a good atmosphere in the group and to well, produce a, a nice collaborative environment. So I think at the end of the day, uh, we are all, now we are around 30, 30 something people in the group. So it's getting bigger. Uh, and at some point, uh, well, I think that everybody feels like they're involved. Everybody feels like, um, like they're part of the projects and part of the activities that we have. Uh, we also try to have uh, well, many social gatherings so people can really feel like they belong. Um, and we try to really collaborate uh, and, and, and work together. No, I think that's really the key. Uh, we are all uh, good in certain areas and then we can always get help in other areas. And in that sense, being able to collaborate and do things together really, really helps everybody. So it's not about just trying to uh, have more funding and more projects and more people uh, because at the end, the amount of time that you will be able to spend on each of those things will be smaller no? when you have many, many things going on. Um, so if you want to have a bigger activity and you think that that's something that fits with your, your ideas and your career plan, uh, at the end, I think uh, it's really important to, well, to be very organized, basically, to be very organized and to try to have a good plan, to try to collaborate and surround yourself with uh, good people that you trust, that you can trust each other uh, and try to do uh, interesting things together. I, I always say that I only work with people that I, that I like, that, uh, I'm not uh, going to, you know, when you do research, uh, you have the great luck to choose the problems that you want to work on and also choose the people that you want to work on. So I'm not going to work with someone that I don't uh, enjoy uh, working together with because that's not going to be good for the project or for anyone. So just try to focus on, yeah, on the good projects and the good uh, ideas and on the good people. I think that's that, that way things will go smoothly and you will, you will thrive. So with this, I have my next question is connected with this one that uh, as you mentioned that you want to work with your like minded person. So what is the process for our prospective PhD students to join your research group? And what are the essential qualifications you look for, be it for a PhD or as a postdoc, if someone wants to join your group? Yeah. I mean, the process uh, depends, but uh, I mean, I can speak for, for KTH, and that's where I am. Uh, in general, um, the, the process always goes through a, a public announcement. Yeah? So um, we usually get many emails of people who are interested and, and, and who want to want to work together. Uh, and that at KTH, uh, it doesn't work like that. So, I mean, uh, yeah, usually those emails will not help very much because if there is not an open position, there is no possibility to recruit anyone. So the best thing that you can do is to keep an eye on the on the vacancies web of KTH. And if there are openings uh, in a lab that you like, then you can apply and then you can try to go through the through the process. So it's always an open uh, call where people will apply. There will be a selection process. There will be shortlisted interviews. And then after the interviews, the selected candidates will be will be chosen. <laughs> so that's basically the process. That's how it, how it typically goes. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, you, I mean, you need to wait for that opening. If there is not an opening, then there is nothing that can be done, essentially. 
Um, I always like to work with people who are willing to um, to collaborate in the group. So we have a big group. Uh, I like to work on different topics and to have a quite multidisciplinary approach. We have uh, fluid mechanics, uh, high performance computing, machine learning. We also have sustainability. We have some exp experimental work as well. So you know, one person cannot be a big expert on everything. That's, that's a principle of life. You can't know it all and you need to know that. What you need to know is that um, you can uh, communicate effectively, you can collaborate, you can rely on other people and to try to really um, have a good collaboration and a good um, and a good interaction. So I always try to uh, hire people who are uh, open, communicative, who want to... Uh, who are motivated, who are excited about these problems. And at the end, that they will fit well in the group and that they will really, you know, contribute and they will get a lot of, uh, a lot from the experience, basically. So, uh, so I just want to ask that, as you mentioned, that people who wants to join as a PhD have to have to go through the process of KTH. So if someone wants to uh, join under you as a PhD and uh, before he wants to, uh, wants to collaborate with you, so what will be your uh, response in that case? That depends. Um, that depends because uh, usually uh, we prefer to do it if there is some framework to establish that collaboration. So if the person is doing a master thesis at KTH, then it's very easy because we, we can just uh, work together and supervise this, the project or maybe have a couple of supervisors <laughs> or if there is some sort of uh, exchange program that they can spend a semester a semester here through their government or the university, then that things that's usually the easiest way. You know, that one can find a, a framework to have a collaboration uh, and then after knowing each other for a while, if there are openings, because of course the openings, um, that's maybe another thing of, uh, of, of the Swedish system. Uh, typically you, you need to have you know funding to be able to make the openings. And it's not like um, you can just, uh, you have someone who is a really good candidate and then you can open a position. You can open a position when you have the funding, which is not always at the same time as when you have someone ready to start. Um, so at the end, the best is to find a framework where you can come and visit and do something together and then see if there is opportunity to continue later on as a PhD or as a postdoc. Uh, there are always possibilities. Uh, do you think that having a good coding skills, uh, as you mentioned, you are, you, your work is mostly on industrials and applied. So having a good coding skills is essential for joining your group? It's not essential, uh, but of course, uh, of course, it will help, right? Because uh, at the end, we work mostly with computers, uh, we do high performance computing, we do machine learning, uh, we do simulations. Um, so most of what we do has to do with uh, computers, uh, computer science and numerical codes. Uh, so being able to, to implement, being able to spend time in front of the code and not being scared of, you know, making your hands dirty and touching the code and trying things and compiling and seeing when things don't work, why they don't work. Uh, that's, that's something that is very important, of course, uh, because our activity is mostly numerical. No? I mean, if you want to join an experimental group, then you probably have to develop other skills no? and be good with wrenches and not being scared of uh, assembling something that, and that it could break. Um, in our case, we do mostly simulations and therefore uh, it is helpful not to know about computers and to, and, and to be open to, to learn. No? At the end of the day, uh, in the group, we can always uh, help each other and find possibilities to, to, to develop the skills that are necessary for the, for the projects. So one related question with this, that uh, uh, what do you think? I mean, in the long run, which one do you believe is more effective for a researcher's success? Is that a coding skills or the art of paper writing? Art of paper writing. Um, well, uh, the art of paper writing, uh, that, that's a bit of a, um, of a subset. I mean, it's not only about writing papers. I would say that that's the um, being good at the, the scientific pro process as a whole. Right? I mean, being able to formulate a hypothesis, being able to find a way to assess the hypothesis, being very good at reading the literature, having critical thinking skills, um, assessing the literature in a critical way where you can see, okay, these are interesting things, but there's a gap here. Let's look at this gap. Let's try to develop it. Let's try to uh, establish hypothesis to complete the gap in the literature. And then writing is a skill itself, of course, uh, but I wouldn't say that... Um, 
uh, not writing as an abstract, as an isolated skill, but more as part of a context of the scientific process. And writing is not only uh, being very good at, at expressing yourself in, in English or in another language. It's also about creating nice figures. It's also now about uh, being able to convey a lot of information in a very elegant way. Uh, designing figures is, is difficult because you don't just want to put the stuff that you did. You want to add some value. You want to add some, you know, mental input to the way that you're presenting the data, right? Uh, so those are uh, very important skills. Uh, for anyone, not for anyone, not for someone doing just numerical work or theoretical work, for any scientist, no, that's essential. Uh, numerical skills, uh, I think that, of course, I work in, in numerics um, or, in, or in areas that have to do with code development. So, of course, for me, it's a very important skill, but it's not the only one. We work very close to experimentalists where we really, really want to check in the lab uh, the methods and the theories that we are developing based on numerical data. Uh, so I would say that being familiar with experiments and at least uh, being aware of limitations, of advantages compared with simulations is also important. So, yeah, I mean, in general, even if you're in an experimental group, being aware of simulations, I mean, I, I started my PhD doing experiments and then I started to do simulations and then I started to do machine learning. So being aware of what the other studies and what the other techniques can do and cannot do. That's very important because when you're comparing numerical and experimental results, you should be aware of the type of uncertainty, of the type of limitations of the measurements, of the type of limitations of the simulations in order to have the best possible comparison. So, of course, uh, you, if you have a complete set of skills, that makes you more open-minded and in general more capable of uh, designing better experiments or better simulations. So thanks, Professor, for such an insightful discussions and thanks for your time. So uh, I have uh, I have only last question, which I usually ask to all my guests that uh, if you have any advice for freshers, freshers, I mean, undergraduate students or postgraduate students and for young researchers, those who wants to join as a PhD or those who are in dilemma that whether to join as a PhD. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the most important is to is to do things that you that you like to do, to find something that you love, to find some passion. Um, so not doing a PhD just because because you need to do a PhD or because you think it is nice to do a PhD. A PhD is a, is a great gift if you are loving what you're doing, or it can be really tough if you are just not on a topic that you fully enjoy, right? So to find something that you really like, if you, um, it's a great commitment in the PhD. So to be really sure that this is really something that you want to do. Um, and if that's the case, then, then go for it and go for it and try to find um, well, a good environment, a good group, a good uh, supervisor that you might uh, enjoy working with. Uh, do not look too much at uh, the metrics of the group and if they publish a lot or not. The most important is that you find uh, a good environment, a good group, someone who can support you, someone who can really uh, give you good opportunities and basically help you to learn and grow. And that's, that's I think, uh, not necessarily about publishing, not necessarily about, uh, you know, numbers, but more about your own personal growth and development. That's really the, the key of a PhD. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I wish you all the best for your future interviews and have a nice day. Bye. Yeah, thank you. It was nice to meet you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch.